The following podcast is a ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church. Hear now the word of the Lord as it is found in Hebrews chapter 6, beginning at verse 13. Now, when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus, Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So, when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this uh, as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. O. Palmer Robertson is a PCA missionary hero and was one of the professors when I was at Knox Seminary. He's written a magisterial book on the covenant. And um, as as I was working on this sermon, I, I kept thinking to myself, really, I should just pull up a stool and just start reading O. Palmer Robertson. They're so rich and so good. At one point, he simply says uh, that a covenant may be defined as a bond in blood sovereignly administered. It is the means by which we relate to him, he relates to us, and he relates us to all the rest of us. That beauty is portrayed powerfully in this very short passage in Hebrews chapter 6, right as we come bumper to bumper with Hebrews chapter 7. There's so much here. We need to pray that God would open our eyes to behold the wonder of it. Father, we do pray that even now. Thank you for your word. Uh, We pray that it would sink deep into our hearts and that we would be induced to lay hold of the anchor of our hope. For Jesus, our forerunner, has gone inside the Holy of Holies and presented a perfect sacrifice. We pray this with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, The uh, pastor theologian uh, Barry Cooper has observed that the central spine of the biblical narrative can be described in a single word, covenant. Covenant is a word that appears more than 300 times uh, in the scriptures, and it's interchangeable synonyms, words like promise, oath, pledge, and vow, appear In another 300 passages, it is central to our understanding of the great redemptive story. In fact, Sinclair Ferguson has said, covenant theology is the basic understanding of the whole Bible story. And it is a description of the way in which God relates to his creation and humanity by way of his very great eternal promises. Covenant, he says, is not the only thing in the storyline of the Bible, but it is the undergirding structure that unites the whole and makes sense of it. The Westminster Confession of Faith puts it this way. 
uh, the distance between God and his creatures is so great that they could never have any apprehension of him as their blessedness and their reward except by some voluntary condescension on God's part, which he has been pleased to express by way of covenant. Covenant is uh, one of those concepts that is... uh, that is so deep, so wide, so high, so broad, uh, that it is difficult to get a hold of. In a sense, it is the universal field theory of the story of redemption. Uh, God, when he relates to us, he relates to us covenantally. So he comforts us covenantally. He judges our sins covenantally. He... uh, He cares for us covenantally. He fellowships with us covenantally. He disciplines us, rewards us. He cares for us covenantally. Uh, Perhaps it is because of this richness and broadness that uh, Susan Hunt has rightly said, covenant actually defies definition. Uh, We think (laughs) that... If we define covenant, we will understand it, but that is as futile as thinking that the definition of motherhood will give us an experiential knowledge of the concept. Mamas will tell you, it just ain't so. Covenant is not just an idea to understand, she says. It is a relationship that transforms. Perhaps that is why, she says, definitions inevitably must conclude with doxologies of praise to our God. That's exactly what we see in the book of Romans, isn't it? The Apostle Paul develops in the first 11 chapters this grand scheme of redemption. He shows us uh, the adoption to the Father of those who were once dead in their trespasses and sins through the perfect atoning work of Jesus Christ. He shows us the wonder of justification by faith and by faith alone. He develops this theme uh, in crescendos of magnificent prose. And when he gets to the end of chapter 11, he can hardly contain himself any longer and he just breaks forth into praise. Oh, the depth and the riches, and the wisdom, and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable are his ways. For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. That should always be our response. When we begin to ponder the wonder of God's covenant mercies, God's covenant love, God's covenant of redemption. Now, when we talk about covenant, oftentimes uh, we think in terms of the old covenant. By that, we mean the Old Testament. And the new covenant. By that, we mean the New Testament. But, But it's probably better for us to think in terms of the covenant of works, uh, which God gave to Adam Uh, by which, through his perfect obedience, he made uh, appropriate relationship and maintained fellowship with God. And then uh, there is the covenant of grace, which God gives after the fall. So what that means is that, uh, that most of the old covenant is in the covenant of grace. And uh, the uh, covenant of works is only the first three chapters of Genesis. And all of the other covenants that we see in the scriptures, uh, whether it's the covenant with Noah, the covenant uh, with Abraham, the covenant with Moses, the covenant with David, uh, all of the covenant renewals under Joshua and Josiah and Nehemiah, all of these are constituent administrative parts of the covenant of grace. Abraham 
comes to know God the same way we do. And that's really the point here. The great continuity that exists from the old uh, to the new. Uh, Robert Godfrey has said, it's important to remember that both the Bible and theologians have used the word covenant to describe a lot of different relationships, but really only one redemptive purpose. So in Hebrews chapter 6, we catch a glimpse of this, the enormously complex notion uh, simplified uh, to just a few verses. The heart of the passage uh, lies in seven propositions. And these seven propositions are anchored by two great certainties or two guarantees. The verses 17 and 18, uh, we have the seven propositions. First proposition, God desired to show convincingly. Uh, literally, he wanted to give us proof. He wanted to give us evidence. He wanted to provide us with a guarantee. A guarantee of what? Well, secondly, that his purposes are unchangeable. They are the divine eternal decrees. Uh, they are administered by his sovereignty and they do not change from the beginning of time to the ending of time. And third, he wants to give these convincing proofs of his unchangeable purposes to the heirs of promise. In other words, uh, the great blessings of Abraham become ours because we are his heirs. We are the heirs of his promise. Fourth, verse 18, uh, we are the ones who have fled to him for refuge. Fifth, therefore, uh, we are induced to have strong encouragement. Sixth, this encouragement is to provoke us to hold on to hope. And seventh, this hope has been set before us. Now these seven propositions are anchored by two unchangeable certainties. Verse 18, God's word of promise and God's covenant oath. And to illustrate uh, just uh, why uh, God's word of promise and God's covenant oath should be so convincing, so encouraging, and so hopeful, the preacher to the Hebrews recalls the story of Father Abraham. Verses 13 through 15. Uh, this is a really beautiful passage, and it's written uh, poetically. There are all kinds of literary devices embedded in this. There are chiasms. There are uh, reflections on the Old Testament stories uh, from Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis uh, 14, uh, Genesis 22. It's so rich. But essentially, this is it. God made a promise. And God swore by himself to guarantee that promise. The promise was to bless and to multiply. Abraham waited patiently. And Abraham obtained the promise. Now the chiasm is is given to us so that we can see the manward part and the Godward part. God made a promise. Abraham obtained the promise. God swore by himself. Abraham waited patiently. And as a result, he was blessed. And his generations after him, his progeny, were multiplied beyond number. So it's important to grasp why this is written so poetically. It's to emphasize the Godward and the manward parts of the covenant. So it's God who promises. It's God who swears, takes a vow. It's God who blesses. It's God who multiplies. What's Abraham's job? 
is to wait and to obtain. That's the gospel. God promises. God swears. God blesses. God multiplies. And we stand back and we receive. So in verse 16, uh, this, uh, this oath structure is explained a little more thoroughly. The oath is a legal confirmation. God swears by himself. Uh, normally you would swear by something greater than yourself, but since there is no one greater than God, he swears by himself so that we might be convinced of his unchangeable purposes. This is why it's a covenant. It's signed, sealed, and delivered. And by this, we know that because it is impossible for God to lie, verse 16, that this guarantee is sure and certain. Therefore, we have strong encouragement. John Owen explains this notion saying, God in his great love provides this strong encouragement through two unchangeable things. The word of his promise and his covenant oath which confirms that promise. Now, encouragement means to be consoled and helped and equipped. The immutability of God's covenant words and oaths relieves us of fears and troubles and sets us to work. What a glorious encouragement indeed. So, when we talk about hope, that we, in the English language, tend to reduce and kind of qualify hope. We, we say, well, I hope so. But as Jay Adams points out, there is no hope so in the gospel. God has sworn. God has promised. God has staked his own oath, his vow, his covenantal certainty upon it. There is no hope so. Hope instead becomes a sure and certain, a steadfast anchor. Look at verse 19. This nautical language is incredibly appropriate for those who sometimes feel like we're in way too deep and the water is over our heads. Or that we're tossed to and fro on the waves of doubt. Or the storms continue to buffet us. Or the torrents that tend to threaten us, to overwhelm us, to capsize our tiny little rowboats, which are untethered and seem to be adrift. What God says in the covenant is you have an anchor. Lay hold of your anchor. It is sure and certain. It has been given to you. It is the promise of God. Uh, This this great anchor of hope is ours because hope has now entered into the inner place behind the curtain. Verse 19. This is temple language. You should imagine uh, the, the, the temple on earth, uh, which was a copy of the glories of the heavenly throne room. The, 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 the high priest, according to Leviticus chapter 16, was able to enter in to the Holy of Holies, go behind the curtain only once a year on the Day of Atonement. The the trouble was is that the priest was just like all of the rest of us. 
he too was a sinner. So he had to offer sacrifices for his own sin as well as for the sins of the people. But we now have a perfect hope. This hope has entered in and gone behind the curtain into the Holy of Holies, spotless, offering a perfect sacrifice. And notice what verse 20 says, uh, that this hope is none other than Jesus. He has gone ahead as our forerunner. In other words, he's leading us there. We go to the Holy of Holies because covered by his perfect sacrifice, we've been washed whiter than snow. Our sins like crimson are no longer ours. They're taken upon him. He enters in as a forerunner on our behalf. He does this because, of course, he is our great high priest. After the order of that shady character, Melchizedek, who Pastor Jamie is going to tell you about next week. But here's the point of it all. We tend to think that how we relate to God depends on us, what we do, our righteousness, our works, our efforts, our faith. But the covenant declares that God is the one who promises. God is the one who swears. God is the one who blesses. God is the one who multiplies. Our job, like Abraham's job, is to wait and obtain. When we consider the glory of this gospel provision on our behalf, we have to, like the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 11, break forth into praise. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. His oath, his blood, his covenant. They're what support me in the whelming flood. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Jesus, our forerunner, our great high priest, after the order of Melchizedek, has entered into the Holy of Holies, having declared on the cross, it is finished. He presents propitiation before the Father, and it is finished. So when the waves come, lay hold of that sure and certain anchor of hope. It is yours. You who have fled to him for refuge. You who are the heirs of promise. It is finished. This has been the Parish Presbyterian Church Sermon Podcast. For more information about the ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church, please visit www.parishpres.org.